So we just come in, we've just hit the 7 p.m. mark in UK All right. time. All right, well, the boss says it's time to go, Steve, you ready? Okay, so good morning, good evening, good day, everybody. Um, welcome to um, Motivational Interviewing and Beyond webinar. Welcome everybody from around the world who, um, who's joining us. Um, we're delighted that you're here to jump in on this conversation. And welcome to our esteemed panel of um, guests and friends that we have, we're going to have a conversation with today. I'm, I'm Joel Porter, and I'm the, one of the co-hosts here, and I'm based in Christchurch, New Zealand, where it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'm looking very forward to this conversation and I'll be, I'll be really keen to know where we end up. That's, I'm, I'm looking forward to the journey and the destination of this conversation. Steve, how about you? How are you doing? Oh, hello, everybody. I'm Steve Rolnick at 7 p.m. in a beautiful, sunny Cardiff, Wales. And I co-host this with Joel. And what an incredible range of people we've got on the on the show tonight, Joel. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I, I hand it over to you in the full knowledge that this is going to be a flourishing discussion. All right. Well, if it starts to diminish, Steve, jump in and give it some juice. Um, I also want to also want to say, you know, Angie's Angie's here, but she's in the shadows. Angie is the producer of our um, our webinar. And she does such an amazing job in keeping us in line and keeping things going. You know, the other thing that hit me, Steve, before you came on, is um, we're going to be moving into the third year of doing this in a month or two. <laughs> and I just remember the conversation sitting on the couch on the telephone with these thinking, let's do something fun. And we started this. So... I'm, I'm excited that we're continuing. It, it, I'm, I'm, it's great that it's still fun. And I'm excited that people find it meaningful. Yeah, enjoy. Joel, can I, can I confess something? It's a credit to, you, to your warmth as a human being that I eventually loosened up and relaxed. The first two webinars we did, Russell Calderwood had to feed me whiskey to cope with my nerves. <laughs> well, thanks to Russell. <laughs> okay. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and get going. So, so here's, um, here's the idea behind this one. Is partly, I have, my own, um, I have my own reason that I wanted to do this because I'm, I'm working alongside um, people that are involved in the correctional system right now in, in terms of the service that I'm working for. It's a, more of a reintegration, somewhat of a rehabilitation um, addiction rehabilitation service. It's a residential residential service for about twenty four guys, and um, I'm wanting to improve our outcomes drastically. So I thought, what a better way to pick the brains of people that I know and respect that have been doing this work for a long time. Um, and a lot of people aren't aware of how much motivational interviewing has found its way into corrections around the world. And so I figured we'd just bring them on and have a conversation and see what's happening. So here's where I would like to start. I'd like to start a little bit because not everybody who's with us works in corrections or has been around for a long time. The, um, I'd like to talk about motivational interviewing finding its way into corrections because in, in one way, it seems like the opposite when you think of corrections 20, 30 years ago and the way the mindset and sort of the philosophy about consequences and punishment. Um, and I'd like to, I'd really like to hear the story of how MI kind of moved its way into the forefront of, um, of corrections. And Mike was just saying earlier that, you know, in Michigan, they're training so many thousands of people that work within the corrections um, department in motivational interviewing. And, and, I'd love to know what the shift was and, and if there was a buy-in point where the paradigm shift or the worm turned. And I know Jen's been doing this for a long time. So Jen, can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about 
am I wandering into corrections in your world? Sure. Um, Jennifer Luther, I am currently at Florida State University um, at the College of Social Work uh, as a project director over there. And um, I also have Correctional Rehabilitation Services. And I started in the early 2000s with motivational interviewing. I walked into, I had been uh, really trying to figure out how to help people make meaningful changes. And I had been working in an abuse hotline and saw everything that didn't work in corrections <laughs> from that perspective, because these were calls that were coming in that were in our residential and prison type facilities. So often it was a staff person that was the, the person being having the allegation against them. And so I walked into the ONMI training and went, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. And was so excited and haven't haven't stopped since to um, to look at it and, and pull it out, but it really fit for me under the Canadian model, often called the principles of effective intervention, where we, we assess for risk and need, and then we want to respond to that in a way that connects with the person, is person-centered, but also uses cognitive behavioral interventions. And so that's where we placed it in that theory base. And it made a lot of sense there. And I think it was really helpful. Um, Mike, do you have the same kind of placement of your MI in the training that you do in corrections? Curious if you yeah, place the, it there. Uh, I know and, that, I know that- Mike, uh, why don't you Mike, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Okay, I'm, I'm Mike Clark and I came into the Mint organization in 2003. I was a probation officer and a uh, hearings magistrate at our court, uh, left there and went into the training world and started to train in corrections on strength-based practice, Jen. And, and I, I knew it was the way to work with offenders because I saw so many abuses power people that were just being really terrible once the door was shut. Um, so I knew that was it, but if someone were to come into me and say, well, I know I'm in the court and I know I'm under court supervision, but I love meth and I want to keep doing methamphetamine. I didn't have, a, I knew to be straight based with that person, but I didn't know what to do to move them away from the meth. And then I found motivational interviewing and it just went like that. So, yeah. That was that was my trade. And in, in in terms of motivational interviewing, weaving its way into the fabric in, of of correction and best practice oh, within yeah. corrections, what's what's been some of the experiences around the world? Mike, you can go ahead and start, and then we'll jump over to to Freddie and then to Kim. Well, I just I'm just going to take a second and tell you how it started, and then I want to hear from these people. Yeah, Kim yeah, and, and Frederick. Um, <clears throat> Remember, uh, Bill Miller's paper came out in 1983. And by the late 1980s in Birmingham, England, uh, a two-day training in motivational interviewing was mandatory. So if you think about that, we were right in with motivational interviewing and the early research from the very beginning. Um, and Jen, you know reasons why it took off, but I thought that that was... And the research is finally catching up. Um, they're talking about the synthetic officer, the hybrid officer, uh, using care and control. And what they have found over the decades that I've been around is that you can't just, you have to do the relational work. You have to use the spirit of MI in your work. So there's, that was the history. We've been here since the beginning. Jen is right, it was a real tough go, even in our organization, because they didn't think we belonged. How about, Frederick, how about, how about in Sweden? I know that you've been a big part of introducing motivational interviewing and working in corrections in Sweden. Yeah, well, both yes and no. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Frederick Eliasson from, from North Europe, Sweden. And uh, when I came into to the correctional world, uh, MI was partly spread already. I started working in an old prison down in the south of Sweden where MI was not being used. It was very confrontational. And I remember it specifically because when, we, when you were new in that environment, 
no one of the oldest talked to you, no one of your colleagues that were that that had worked for some time talked to you because you were the newbie, you were worth nothing in in their eyes. So it's highly confrontational, even between staff members. And I and I really remember how how you sort of you needed to prove yourself worthy of being a colleague and and the way you proved your worth was to show that you too were confrontational that was the way to be part of of the group and and the funny thing is that uh, in in 2011 i uh, i was one of the few people that was pretty handy with talking english so i was given the task of showing some scientists around like some new folks and I, and I did that and they were really nice and we talked and we chatted and I, I didn't know what, what they were doing. And um, quite some time later, that was actually Bill Miller who I showed around the, the <laughs> facilities and I didn't know at the time. So, uh, so the one who really should be talking about how MI ended up in Sweden is, is Lars Forsberg, who we mentioned just a, a little bit ago, because he was really the one who, who did the early, early trainings with, with you, Steve, and with Bill, and, and, and brought MI into, into Sweden and, and into to, um, corrections. I came along quite some time after that. Okay. All right. Well, well, we'll see how we go and see if Lars is up to joining the conversation. All right. All right, Kim. Let's bring it down to uh, New Zealand and I'll kind of... In yeah, and, and uh, kia ora tos, uh, tato. Um, look here, um, Ken McMaster from um, Ototahi Christchurch. Um, it's interesting that when I think back in the kind of history is that I think what, what really triggered the idea was that offending is expensive. Well, that's the bottom line, it's expensive. It's expensive at, at um, a containment level, expensive with the people's lives, but it's also expensive with the harm done to the community. And, um, and so this idea of take, uh, being tough on people, and we, we know that it just means they come out the door and that lateral behaviour just, just gets much worse. So again, it's been interesting. I think I did my first training in 1987 with Corrections here. And we were doing a, running a product out around um, MI, relapse prevention and, and CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy. So just trying to get probation officers to think more carefully about being thoughtful about practice. Because again, when I think about the idea that, you know, I, I think that what it comes back to for me is, is the idea of being much more compassionate. Um, because if we think about the lives of people who end up behind bars, particularly, and, and end up in, in corrections, there's often a whole trauma story. And I think we, we've started to embrace that idea. And, and I think in some ways, when we're working with people who have had really tough life, life starts, you know, those, I think the... Uh, adverse child experiences, which many of you know, the people we work with do, you've got to be compassionate. You've got to say, actually, what's your story? And, and how's your story now leaking out into your story as an adult? So I think that's probably got me, and, and I think that fits very nicely with an MI kind of frame of, of compassion and, and also then sitting with someone saying, how can we figure this out together? And that notion, I know, Steve, you've written a lot about around partnership, and I think that's one of the key kind of uh, frames that I think has been really useful and, and, and seeing that now develop within this part of the world particularly and I think it's uh, it's been a quite a rich experience as, as, as organizations try and go how do we actually get this, this we don't replicate abuse of practice which effectively is what a lot of folk we're working with do so our staff replicate our staff actually being abusive in their own practice and then saying to people well don't do what I do well you know, we all, we all know that we learn by watching people how they act. Can I make a, can I offer this reflection, Ken? Um, listening to Frederick and you people speaking, um, these memories come flashing <laughs> in my mind. And um, Karl Okafabring, for example, in Sweden was a, he's a grandfather, but he was, passionate about the use of MI in your environment. But look, if I take myself right back to the middle 70s, where I first, uh, where a fire was first lit for me, and um, gave rise to my work with Bill Miller, it was basically the, the experience of dehumanizing environments and practice. 
it happened to be in, a, in, in addiction treatment, but um, today I experienced it in an elite sports club. Uh, a practice that was dehumanizing, undermining, and destructive. So it's therefore no wonder that in an environment like criminal justice, there's the greatest risk for people being treated in a dehumanizing manner. So I guess in that sense, it's no, no surprise that, that MI uh, gains traction and should gain traction in this environment. Just a comment, Ken. Well, boy, I want to jump in behind Steve and talk about the dehumanizing aspects of when, <clears throat> when I first came in in the early 2000s. Um, and it's, it's happened all the way till now. During COVID, there wasn't, I started to write and publish. And I literally got a, an article all set to publish for MI with probation officers because it was a... Um, it was a special edition. Uh, funds had come from our United States government to, to finance it. Uh, they had a couple guest editors. They had signed off on it. The peer reviewers had signed off on it. And the editor came back from vacation and read it and said, no way was he going to publish something that detrimental. Why, it was just an insult to the field that I would talk about a certain group of, a minority group of probation officers that were being abusive. And I said, I don't know how you can take that position when researchers have labeled them. They label them as zero tolerance. They label them as muscle officers. And I said, if you have a, if you have a literally a name from the research, then there, it has to be present. Uh, we were, we, we went head to head on that one. You know, I, I didn't, what I didn't say, I guess, in my introduction that might be helpful right here, that's been a really awesome experience for me, however horribly it started, is that in 1999, I wasn't really sure what, or 1992, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And um, unfortunately, I ended up being the victim of a robbery and shooting perpetrated by a gang member. And this was his initiation into the gang. And I almost lost my life. And I had um, life-saving surgery. I had blood transfusions. I spent two years learning how to use my left arm and hand again. But my journey really of healing was more about why would someone do this, you know? And, and, and why, and you always ask when you've been a victim like that, why me? And I wanted to figure that out. And, and it was very important to me. And so I did everything in my power during that healing journey to un try to understand and put myself in that kid's perspective. And um, he was eventually charged and we went to court and I was asked to testify. And I remember standing, I remember um, going up on the stand and while I was up there, the door opened and a woman came in and I you're looking down at this courtroom, right? And you've got, I had like the entire prosecution side was just filled with people who loved me and cared about me. And then you have this him and his defense, his court appointed um, defender on the other side alone. Well, this door opens and a woman walks in and I instantly knew that this was his mother. And she looked at him and she looked at me and she looked at the court and I could see that she was nervous about this whole situation coming in late. And she slipped just quietly in the back row of of the prosecution side of the courtroom. And in that moment, my heart broke for him a little bit because I thought, here you are, you're all alone. You're just a 17 year old kid who's gotten messed up with the wrong crowd. And, you know, I understood why she did it, but I still felt compassion for him. 
Well, recently I had the opportunity to connect with someone, a reporter that was in the courtroom that day and we had lunch. And she told me that she was ever forever changed by that. And that it was, it was obvious to everyone in the courtroom that I felt some empathy for him. And so I started right from the very beginning. As soon as that was over, his attorney <clears throat> came up and apologized to me for asking me these questions. And I said, no, you're doing your job. You were doing your job. You know, you, this is what you're supposed to do. And this kid needs a chance too. And there's lots more to that story, but I think it's important. It's been really important for me to be able to, when I go in and do these trainings with these officers and they say, you don't understand how bad our clients are, how bad the offenders are. I have been able to thankfully say, well, actually I kind of do. Um, and it's still no excuse not to treat people like human beings and to help them see that they can be something different and better moving forward. Well, <clears throat> what a powerful story, Jim, thank you. And it's a testament to you that you do the work you do. And I've, I've spent time with you and you've told me other things and I know where your heart is when it comes to working with people in the correction system. Um, that's, that's amazing. Um, and this, I think, is a really interesting point because we're working with the castoffs and the throwaways in the, from society in some ways, is, is the way they've seen. They're, they're almost unworthy of getting help in the public eye sometimes. Um, and the work that I'm doing right now, and I've been working in drug and alcohol pretty much my whole career, and I feel like this is the most challenging group of people I've ever worked with. I think the only other group that I think has brought more challenges is when I was working with people without a home that had severe mental illness and they were using alcohol and drugs to medicate their symptoms in terms of, in terms of the outcomes. Um, because a lot of the, the men that I'm working with are coming out of prison and they have six months with us and we were doing and creating and building a program. And it's very unfortunate that the majority of them end up back in prison sooner rather than later. And personally, I'm intellectually I'm stuck about what can we do different? And I know my intuition <clears throat> is it has to be relationally. It has, there has to have the foundation like Ken, and Mike was saying that, there, that it has to be relational. And, and kind of from there, what I like, because I don't think the rest of y'all know the story I'm about to ask Freddie to tell. Um, <clears throat> Frederick, I'd like for you to tell the story that you told me in Berlin at that funky bar that we were in with the neon flamingos. Um, I remember that I, one, yeah. I, I was moved by that story, and I'm still moved by it today. Well... Well, well, thank you. Um, I, I didn't quite remember telling that at that point, but let's see if I can remember it. Um, this, this is some years ago. Uh, I was uh, was working with uh, mandated um, uh, people who with addiction problems. So the addiction was so severe that they were taking into care. And... Uh, I was working as a, as a sort of MI trainer and relational specialist or whatever you call it for, for on, in, the, in the HQ of, of this government uh, organization. And I was phoned up by one of the senior um, managers that said, um, look, Fred, we, we have a situation where we can't provide room for mandated um, uh, people. And uh, these are these are people that come directly from the streets. They have them signed off by uh, by two doctors that they need to go into care. And if we can provide room, there's there's risk of them dying. So we we can't have a queue for for this. This is uh, acute um, placements. So uh, could you could you start a ward like really quick to to host these people? 
and I'm and that's usually what I did. I was a manager for that type of facilities, and I said, "Yeah, sure, it's coming into winter holidays, and and you know the MI trainings in Sweden take like a break for the for the for the Christmas. So yeah, sure, uh, where's the facility? Uh, we we don't have that yet. We uh, you're the first one I'm I'm calling. Yeah, sure, but where's where who who's the staff? As I said, you're the first one we're we're calling. Uh, okay, so what's the time frame? We were hoping on two weeks. And I said, sorry, that's impossible. No, we, we think you'll manage. And I was I was sort of desperate in my mind to get me off this assignment because I think it will it will never it will never work. So I said, you know, you, I, I need a lot of money to do this. And he said yes to everything because they were so desperate. So we set up, we found somewhere to be uh, like an, an open ward within a, a prison we rented, stuff like that. But the problem was to, to get staff, we had to get people from similar facilities doing their overtime in our facilities. That was the only way that we fast enough could get people in to take care of, of those who uh, who were placed there, but that meant that each day and each night, because this was like twenty four uh, hour operation, uh, it was a new group of people who never met each other, and uh, so and, and there were no time to have like you know kickoffs and this should be our value base or uh, we could we didn't have time for anything of that, so I was sort of in my mind started thinking how is it possible to try to get these um, staff to work in a, in a similar way with a similar sort of value base. So what I came up with was that everyone that was gonna work in the facilities had an hour with me. And what I tried to sort of explain to them or, or um, see if, if they wanted to sign up for was that um, in this ward, we have uh, a couple of goals. Um, actually, we have two goals. The first goal is that the people who live here, they, want, they should want to be with you. They, they, want, they should like to hang out with you. But that's your job, to make them like hanging out with you. All right. And they must have the experience that you want to hang with them. Okay, so how, how should we do that? That's your job. Uh, you are experienced in this field. This is the goal. They need to like to be with you. And they need to feel that you like to be with them. Mm. That's it. And if you want to do that, you can come work here. If that not a fit for you, we try to find someone else. And we were open for like, I don't know, four or five months while, while they were building in other places. And we had zero incidents. And these were people coming handcuffed to our facilities. Um, and we had zero incidents, which, which usually have quite a lot of incidents when you're a new ward opening up with people that are taken right off the streets, uh, getting off like heroin and, and other type of like serious sort of drugs. Um, and we went to the hospital and back and forth with them, uh, but zero incidents on the ward. So wow. yeah, that was quite a journey uh, for me at least. I, I, those two points, have really resonated and stuck with me, right? That, that you that you that you wanted the the workers to do, right? That the, the clients want to be here, and they and they actually believe that you want to work with them and be with them. Mm -hmm. You know, Joel, that's that, that that story from Frederick. I was I came back to do I did two days of a initial motivational learning training. I came back for two days of advance and an officer came up to me and he said, oh, I'm glad you're back. And so what do we do? We use an open-ended question. Tell me more, why are you glad? He said, well, he says, I gotta tell you that this has really changed me. I said, how so? 
And he said, well, you know, now when someone, he says, I don't brace for action anymore. He said, now when someone comes in and says, I don't want to be here, you tell me what to do and I'll darn well do it. I want to get out of here. I look at that person and I go, oh, boring. And he said, but if somebody comes in and says, I don't give a damn what that judge says, I'm not doing it. I go, oh, a chance to use, he was enlivened. He was, he, he, he was recharged. And then another story was from Pennsylvania. There's some people here in Pennsylvania and it was a train the trainer. And people come in very, what, uh, anxious, worried, uh, nervous. So I get a lot of people with, that are real grumpy at the, at the beginning of the day before we start. And a woman came up to me and she said, um, I've got an issue. I said, oh, gee, what's going on? She said, well, it's not about the training today. It's about, it's about what's, what's happened here. What has happened here? She said, look, I need to tell you this. She said, from the county where I work, they know me as the Black Widow Spider. And then she turned her head away from me because she started to cry. And she said, I, I can't be that way anymore. And I don't know what to do. And I sat there and I thought, this woman has an identity crisis. And that was caused by being trained in motivational interviews. And, and I, I get the sense that that's kind of the whole, the correctional experience is that it, <clears throat> motivational interviewing put a spanner in the works, right? Threw a wrench in the fan, so to speak. Um, and I'm wondering what that's been like as you, as y'all, as far as I know, and, and other people, of course, have ushered this in. So when you, first, when you first said, you know, this is the hardest population to work with, my first thought was the staff? Or yeah. <laughs> or yeah. The I got to be careful because <laughs> I, I think it's a paradigm shift. Yeah. That's think. right. Because, because it is a challenge and we often, I think we often expect um, people that have been involved with the justice system to be a little prickly. And, and, and have some rebellious sort of uh, ways that they've been comfortable operating. Um, we don't always expect that from professional staff. And so as this came in, I think we all had to be a little bit prepared for um, being cha change agents, not just in relationship to those, um, those individuals that are justice involved, but also with staff. I had the opportunity we got a, a, I won't say what state, a big state asked us to come out and do something with their um, solitary confinement guys. And this was a big penitentiary um, out in the, in the West. And we got this note that they, this email that they, they wanted us to design some kind of a therapeutic intervention. And they were gonna take these guys, they had designed some chairs that they'd bolted to the floor and they were gonna lock these guys in these chairs and they were gonna run therapeutic groups. And honestly, I thought it was a joke at first. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is a joke, right? They're not really gonna lock them into this. Yes, no, 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 they're going to. So we put together some stuff and we put together some CBT and some emotion regulation stuff and a variety of different, um, a package of really nice interventions for what we thought was needed. And I went out to train it. But first I, um, I wanted to see the, these chairs and I wanted to see this room. So you go into a prison and you know, you go in and you go in and you go in and you go in, you go through all these sally ports and, and gates and so forth. And finally, I'm in the very center of this thousands of people prison and I'm, uh, I'm in the, the segregation unit. And so I got to see the chairs and they weren't so scary. I thought they were gonna be like an electric chair or something where you're you know, strapped down to it, but it, it, it looked more like a desk and that was okay. And, and so they said, well, let's go over and we'll have some conversation with just staff and then we'll bring these guys in. So they, they shackled them and they brought them in sort of Changane style and, and put them in these bolted down to chairs and, 
and hooked them into these chairs so they couldn't get up. And, and the, one of the staff kind of pulled me aside and said, you know, these chairs, are, they're really mostly so the staff will feel safe. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's interesting. So we talked and, uh, and then they said, the guys are ready to meet you, um, Jen. And so I went in and I went into the room and I did exactly what you would do if you walk into a room with new people. I walked up to the first gentleman, I put my hand out, I made eye contact and I introduced myself and I shook his hand. And this was a big deal because I had done a couple of things that you really don't do. And I knew I had done them and I had done them on purpose. One is to touch, touch someone. And, and two is to sort of treat them like a regular person. And so I could sort of feel some of those staff behind me get blustered, um, but I did it with full intention. And I went around and I introduced myself to everyone. And then I said, I wanna spend some time with you guys. I wanna hear what your needs are. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what, we, what we'd like to do here. And, and so I started to have a conversation and this was actually a motivational interviewing conversation. And I started with one guy and he was what you would imagine if you were a, a TV character in a, in, a, in a prison movie. I mean, tall, you know, muscular. He'd been working out for, <laughs> for every day for years and years and years, mean looking sort of, you know, prickly. And so I started to talk with him. And I started to ask him, I said, I want to know a little bit about how you got here and sort of what you think you need moving forward. Like, what would you need to be successful when you got out? This question that you're asking, Joel, of, of, of the project that you're working with now. And so he started to talk with me. And as he started to talk with me, I started to use some complex reflective listening. And I was keeping that conversation safe. And, and all of a sudden he, he started tearing up. And, he, and when that happened, when he started to cry, everybody in the room got very uncomfortable. I think I was, not that it matters, but I was probably the only female in the room. There was about six guards in there keeping me safe. And there was a, um, uh, four guys bolted to the chairs. So, um, so this is the situation. Well, he, he asked me to move on and I said, no problem. And so we just went on and we went all around the room and someone went out and got him a brown scratchy paper towel as a Kleenex. Um, and, uh, you know, and then it was finally back to him. And he said, I want, he said, I want to make something very clear. First of all, I do not cry. And certainly not in front of these people. Now, each of those four guys in that room were from opposing prison gangs. So you've got that on top of this paramilitary, you know, uh, guard officer type thing happening. He said, secondly, I'm sitting here and he said, I'm reflecting on what it was that you did or said that made me so emotional. He said, I can't remember the last time someone looked at me and saw not all of the bad things I've done, but my potential to be something better moving forward. And Miss Luther, when you looked at me, I knew you saw that. Well, it was really my words and it was really motivational interviewing. And when we left that room, me and the, the sergeant and the captain and the guards went back over into the conference room. And you know what they said? Oh my goodness, you were doing motivational interviewing. You know, we got trained in that and we were 100% sure that that was not going to work with our guys. And you just did it. And it was amazing. And when I showed up for the actual training day the next day, I had a room full of people ready to learn, ready to listen, and knowing that this was the real thing. And I carry that guy around in my pocket. I checked back in on, on him over the years and he's released now and he hasn't gotten back in trouble, but it wasn't because I did MI, but it was just such a poignant way to understand what these guys experience every day and how giving them that hope in how we see them can make such a huge difference. Hmm. Jim? You have great stories, and I, I totally, you do, and you do. I mean, I've known you for years and years, and um, 
and and it's and, and I've known Mike and I've known Kim and I've known Freddie and 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 I know that the work that you've done with the population and the people you've worked with is coming from the heart and motivational interviewing. Like for a lot of us, that's where we that's what hooked us was the the intention and the spirit behind it. And then the rest came next. And then we were lucky enough to find each other and now this wider audience over time. Um, Ken, I'm really curious that what it was like for you in the early days of talking about motivational interviewing with uh, Kiwi Corrections and then what sort of challenges did that present? Because I've, I've done some training in New Zealand and Australia Corrections and you know, it, it's not an easy, it's not, a, I say this tongue in cheek, it's not an easy sale sometimes. Yeah, well, I think it's, well, I think, well, of course it's not easy. And I, I, Jen, thanks for your story, because I think it encapsulates this idea of what walks into the room. And, and, and I, I love the work around this notion of discord, because, you know, the old shifting that from rolling with resistance, right, which positions the resistance with the person as opposed to what am I bringing into this conversation? What am I bringing into, what am I doing to actually rev somebody up or, or, or to, to meet them and to engage with them? It's the whole fundamental idea that uh, what's this be between us is the kind of key idea. What's the, what's the kind of stuff that gets in the way that we can kind of get the rubbish out of the way so we can actually have those those heart-to-heart -heart kind of conversations, those connections. And I think it does come back to this idea of who are you, who am I? Now, I think you know, in some ways I always think about, you know, a question that I always think is a critical one is, is what's going to be like to work with me? <laughs> you know, and I teach this stuff because I think that somebody, because we, we, we can't make assumptions that actually that I'm going to be the person because I'm different, I might, have a, I might have a different sexual orientation to you, I might have a different, sort of, I'm different age-wise, I might have a different, you know, um, gender, you know, position that I'm taking. So there's all these things that actually walk in the room, and I, I kind of like the idea of going, so asking the question, so what can be like to work with me? You know, I might not to be a dad, if it's an age-related kind of uh, difference there. So that idea of diversity and how we find a fit, how we find a place to meet, and, and I think, so that becomes very interesting. I've been really fascinated in some of these ideas around um, some of Fergus uh, McNeil's work around, um, around assistance to criminal activity. And I think it's interesting. And he says three things. He says, the first thing, people need some motivation to live life differently. There's gotta be something in it for them, right? And I think that makes sense. We are often motivated by self. There's gotta be something in it. But then the second thing is I've gotta have the capacity. So I've got to have the, the skills that actually, that maybe I'm underskilled to actually live, have some things. But the third thing is I've got to have the, the context that will support my change. And, and that's the wider kind of social stuff. Because I think, Jen, you're right. People look down on people who have offended. It's easier to judge. It's much harder to understand. And, um, and, and I always say that that idea that um, if I had your experience, maybe we'd be, I'd be sitting where you are. And, uh, you know, I, I might be that person who's sitting in your seat. And so there's something about, I think, in this, uh, in this work around having heart. But also, I think it's the idea that we all have a position to pay, uh, a place to sort of uh, take position. So I think the notion of partnership, when I think about uh, training case managers, for example, who are in prison, they have a key role in motivation work. You know, because they are managing sentence expectations. They are warming people up to do a special condition of, of a sentence, or it might be doing a program. It might be around actually helping them to resolve some, some ambivalence about doing something. So that idea of meeting, greeting, and actually finding out, getting a relationship established, because again, you've got time on the ground and using that time. But, I, but the other thing I'd like to say, Joel, in terms of thinking about your stuff, I'd be really fascinated by the warm up work that takes place before people even come to you. And, and that motivational work that happens as part of um, discharge planning, particularly if coming from a prison to a community-based alcohol and drug um, residence. It, this should be a partnership. This should be a, a story that is ongoing. Everyone has a place in that story. And, and even with the story of the guys who are doing, um, your, your probation officers who will be still engaged with those, those men on your program. I'd say that actually, are they working, 
are they having conversations around maintenance stuff? Are they helping to deconstruct the changes that are happening? Are they reinforcing those changes? Because what, what we know, and I think it goes back to the story you said earlier, Jed, about the isolation, many of the people we work with don't have many pro-social people in their lives. So who they hang with are people who tend to undermine. So again, that idea of actually, they might be the person who actually can help to, you know, talk about actually what's making sense or what's not making sense. So I think it's, it, 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 we're all in this together. It's a kind of team approach. And I think that's, if we're all working from a kind of MI songbook in some ways, I think that's really helpful. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I think that's uh, some of my kind of reflection on the conversation so far. Yeah. Steve, what kind of reflections and thoughts are you having as you listen? I was thinking of what I felt about Jen's story, and one way to respond is to, is, is, is to think, so what Jen did was empathize with this person, and of course you did. But I think there's another element to it, which is Jen looked forward in that conversation to how life might be different for this person. And MI and quality cares often confused with are oh, just be empathic and listen to someone. And I noticed that very strongly in, in Jen's story that she wasn't just, she was certainly treating him as a person first. And she was certainly empathizing with him and showing acceptance and respect and quite a lot more and compassion. But she was pointing the conversation in the direction of change. And I think that's uh, the, the, the part of MI that's, that's often misunderstood, bypassed. Um, how can I put it, Joel? I noticed this in education and I notice it in sport today. And it certainly shines out of some of these stories that we're hearing, which is that when staff are in a situation where they feel uncertain, maybe under threat, maybe even in danger, when things get stressful, what staff bring in is a kind of a polarized way of thinking. I'm either kind or I'm tough. And because it's difficult, I'm tough. I'm either soft or I'm hard. And because it's stressful, I'm gonna be hard. Or as, or as Mike said, I'm either involved in care or I'm involved in control, and because it's tough, I'm involved in control. And so um, when I listen to you, some of you folk, uh, like Jen's stories, in fact, all of you, you seem to be able to resolve this fairly easily by being soft and respectful of the person, even if you're talking about quite tough subjects. You seem to be able to do that. Frederick, you know, shines out of it. He, Frederick, when he's with people, is not just liking people and being liked. I bet you anything. Okay. It's that wonderful combination of, of being with the person and facing forward. So um, it still bugs me that although you, you folk manage to do this, the majority of staff are still feel, and I've noticed this with, with, the, coaches today trapped in this thing I'm, I'm either going to be tough and tell him he's dropped from the team and that's it and he better go away and sort it out or I'm going to be all soft and pussyfoot around and and you know and there's this beautiful middle ground which we call guiding in MI and uh, it's it, 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 it's Jane's story Sean of that Joel I don't know if that's helpful I see Frederick I've provoked you well, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that that struggle that you're describing and, and um, the notion that you see that in sport coach, coaches as well, because lately I've been quite involved in, in um, dissemination of MI for leaders uh, and leaders struggle with the exact same thing. How can I be tough on the issue? How can I be forward, forward momentum and soft on people? Or, or caring for people, but still getting the work done. And, 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 and to find that 
to find that balance or middle ground is for, for, and I would say for many of us, it's a lifelong learning. But, but the, the, um, the guiding style of MI is one of those pieces of the puzzle that is very, very helpful. That it's not just being sort of nice or being tough on the issue. It's that middle ground and that you have like quite specific um, behaviors for staff, for leaders, for sport coaches that you can lean on. Even, even if you don't get the sort of um, uh, inner picture or you don't really, uh, you're still struggling, there's some fairly concrete things to do that eventually will help you find that sort of middle ground by uh, by doing doing the behaviors which i think is is is, is tremendously uh, helpful and that we hear that a lot i mean mike you were telling quite nice you were really really nice stories about that how the practice of of mi uh, helps change people's way of looking at the people they are working with and in that in that sense Frederick, when we're, for example, training people or writing material for people, it's a mistake to present MI as being about the client or the inmate or whatever. It actually needs to start with us and how we are and how we feel um, and go from there. And I've spent decades making that mistake. And I'm increasingly uh, uh, regretting that. What are you thinking, Mike? Well, you know, there's a couple things that are running through my mind. And it, it's um, one of them, uh, Steve, one of them was about, uh, I was on a call with us. It was a state in our western part of the United States. And they were going to do a full implementation all across their state. And I got uh, Terry Moyers on with us uh, and she was talking with all these managers. And at one point in the conference call, they this person was kind of happy and proud. And he said, so we're gonna train every single person in this state. And Terry said, why would you wanna do that? And the call just went. And I thought there's something. And another, another thing that makes me think about that, Joel, is, and I've been wanting to ask you this, both Joel and Steve, is that I had done work with a community corrections department. I was coming back for some boosters. They'd been at it for a couple of years. And this manager, this supervisor said, you know, Mike, some people just can't learn MI. And I said, tell me more about that. And he said, well, I've got an old muscle guy and he just, you know, we've been trying and trying. He said, the other day I walked by his office and he was meeting with a brand new probationer. And he said, he tore into this guy, just something awful. He said, I stood just outside the door and listened and he was berating him. And, and he was using the, the value of honesty. He said, I'm honest. So I'm going to tell you that I think everything that comes out of your mouth is a lie. And so the, the manager said, Mike, I waited until he took the guy to the door. And I said, I want Frank, I want you to come in and talk to me. Oh, and he said, no, 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 just come on in, come on in. So he sat him down and he said, Frank, we've been trying to train motivational interviewing here for a couple of years, right? He goes, yeah. He said, just take a minute, please. And I want you to know, was, was that a new person? Yeah. Take a minute and tell me what it would have been like to have been that person. Take a minute now and tell me what you think. And he said, Michael, he looked down at the floor and he looked up at me and he said, this is a hard job. He said he couldn't do it. He couldn't. Joel, Steve, what do you think about that? They're, they're just our, I've been, I've been dying to ask you to. I'm going to pause and give it this over to people with more experience than me. My, 
My my experience, and you know, is has been one is you have to have a you have to have a desire. You have to want to learn something new, and you have to be open to learning something new. I can, I mean, I can think of people I've worked with in drug and alcohol over the years who were hard, and that was their that was their identity, kind of like the Black Widow that Jen talked about. That that was their identity. If I'm not challenging and confrontation and confronting and giving tough love and telling people the hard line, I think the I think underneath it is then I don't know what else to do or who I am. Um, and and if you take that away, I think they 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 don't know what to do. And and people will say I'm 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 this way because I care about people, you know. And 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 I think it's a real challenge. And I, it might be beyond the scope of just training them in motivational interviewing, um, because people bring their whole life into their job, and you don't know what's behind that. I mean, I, I can remember a few counselors I worked with who were really almost abusive psychologically to clients. And you get to talking with them and, you know, this is their because their daddy was a drunk. And, you know, this is the way they're, I'm trying to help people, but it's their, their, their issues or their countertransfers playing out in real life. And I think confrontation, you know, can be, the, you know, I'm not going to say it with a, in an umbrella, but I think being provocative and confronting can be helpful if you have a relationship. I remember Molly and Denise talking about this, but it's not the way to create relationships. Right. You know, what are, oh, go ahead, John. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I just, it makes me think of a couple of things as part of the conversation. One of the things that I've taken to t telling those I'm training is we're never going to be, you're never going to be mean enough to make someone kinder. You're never going to be able to be mean enough to make someone else kinder. The way you do, right? It doesn't work. But it makes it me, work. It, it makes me think of, so there's sort of the not doing that thing on the one side, right? And then actually on the other side, sort of, now you're going to do something else. And when we ask people to change, it's the same thing whether we're asking them to change and take on a new professional skill or we're asking them to change a risky behavior as a client. So it's the same thing. You're asking me now to go into unknown territory where I feel uncomfortable. I don't have expertise. You've just taken my expertise away. You've just told me the thing I feel comfortable doing, I can't do that anymore. And now you want me to learn something else. And that takes a lot of work, right? But I think about the, the project, this is just kind of funny. And, and I hope I don't offend anybody with the story. Um, but we were doing a project with the probation department in Singapore. And they actually had two officers. They had the I called it good cop, bad cop, but the, they had the punishing officer. This was the one that still, they still were doing caning <laughs> there. Um, oh, no. The one that caned you. And then they had the one that's going to be there and do the referrals and help you make the changes and stuff. And so when we were first, it was just such an obvious thing, an obvious example of what we were sort of dealing with going in and trying to do these types of trainings in jurisdictions around the U.S. was that you said, everybody said, well, you, you've given me this one hat over here. You've asked me to, you know, make sure they follow the rules and they check in on time and all this. And now you're saying, oh, I've got to have this other hat. And these hats don't go together. And I started thinking, well, maybe it's neither of those hats. Maybe it's a different hat altogether, right? Maybe you've got this, this new hat with the brim that goes this way and that way. And so, you know, I think there's the cessation of the habits that aren't getting you anywhere. And then there's the, the attainment or the journey towards these new habits. And both of those are important to think about in implementation. 
Which is, Jen, I gotta, I'll add on to that and say, and maybe Teresa Chandler has something more here, but the issue about personal choice and control, I tell you, Steve, I couldn't be happier that, that you came out with that three section, look, you say you don't wanna do this and you don't care what the judge does to you. And you know what, it's your choice. But I gotta tell you, I've been here for a few years and I know that if you don't, here's what I think will happen but you don't use that like a baseball bat. And then the third thing, but it, you know, it's still your decision. What do you think you'll do? I mean, just giving officers something like that to be able to suspend that authority role, a lot of them can see that right away, right? Mm. I'm, I'm thinking about the, um, the thing that, uh, Yes, it's the idea of safe care and containment, right? If you're working in a prison, so it's the safety of, of the, the, the the prisoners, the safety of staff, the safety between um, you know prisoners and staff, and it's also safety uh, of escape. So, so that's a, that's a kind of fairly kind of cool, kind of weirded. It's been around a long time. I, I think the thing around behaviour change, as as you're saying, is the idea you got to have some runs on the board. And um, I remember we did a, a large implementation into, uh, into corrections in Victoria. And, and what was really interesting was um, we had this prison officer, quite, quite a jock in some ways. He was, he was a, a really sort of um, you know, pretty sporty kind of guy into martial arts. And he was telling the story about actually after the training, between our trainings, he said, actually, I had a guy who got a dirty urine. Now, there's no drugs in prisons, as we know, but anyway, he's just guys on a methadone program. So the idea is that he has to get out of the medical and they're probably going to sort of say, well, yeah, this is a problem and we're going to probably pull you down pretty quick. So that's generally what, what might happen. And this guy was fired up. So he's going, I'll go down and tell him and I'll, I'll you know, he was really fired up and highly agitated. And, and, and this prison officer thought, well, you know, I could, I could tell him to pull his head in. But he thought uh, after the training, he thought, what I'll do is actually, we've got some time as we're walking down. We'll just, and I just, he says, I start to have a conversation about, well, you know, you seem real fired up at the moment, just some reflection. And uh, I, I wonder what's going to happen if you walk in this kind of, with this kind of attitude happening. You know, what, how are they going to react to you? And, you know, I wonder, what, you know, and, and he's just had this wonderful conversation. So the guy could have calmed down. And, and by the time he kind of got to medical, and, and medical were great. They said, look, what's your story? You know, how come you, because you, know you know the rules. What's your story? And, and so it ended up as a result is, is that they said, we, we'll keep you on the program, but we expect you to do some work with your case manager. And we want you to actually do some work to think about how you're going to be able to say no, say no to the gear that's behind the wire, the drugs that are behind the wire. And that's the deep. So, so in some ways, it's that idea, because again, if you think about parallel process, that, that's a phenomenal piece of work, because again, that's exactly what the guy has to do on the outside. He has to learn to actually say no when stuff is freely available. So we're just mirroring, and, 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 again, and that's, that's the sort of, I think, for officers particularly. The other things actually go, yeah, it works. And so we've got to give them some quick runs on the board, I think, around not just going to a train, but, but again, how's this working? Give us some examples of what's working, like we would do with any behavior change. And we get people back and say, so catch me up on how you got on. And so it's the same sort of process, I think, around change that we want to embed if we can. So we're at the, we have about a half hour to go and I have a, I have a question. It's a question I'm borrowing from uh, Bill Miller. I think it was in Rethinking Addiction. Um, and he said this question and it was, what if we knew everything we know now about corrections, but there were no correct department of corrections what would we do how would we create a correctional service <laughs> i'm actually working on a project to try and do that right now i can't talk too much about it um but it's um, it is an excellent it is an excellent question i i i think it reminds me of that house that you're thinking about buying, but then it has the foundation work is, is cracked and there's so much and the, the contractor comes over and says, you know what, 
you'd be better off to rip this house down and build a new one on the property. <laughs> Sometimes it feels a bit like that. That's not to say there's not a lot of really great people trying very hard to make significant changes in the status quo. So I, so I don't take anything away. There's some amazing leaders in the U.S. and abroad trying very hard to do this. So I, I'm not taking anything away from them because I think we're making progress, but there's a part of, of me and others that I think have felt like if we could build it from scratch from the beginning, if we could do everything we know about best practices, if we could do it without policies standing in the way. Let me give you a perfect example. We go in and do redesigns and we have a look at the behavior management system. And here's what you'll typically see. You'll see a fairly robust set of protocols written about how to punish people. Doesn't mean they do it in perfect accordance with operant conditioning. In other words, they often don't punish close to the behavior. There's often several weeks or something that goes by. So they're not doing it perfectly, but they have a robust system around it. And then you say, okay, what's your, what's, what's your system around behavioral reinforcers? What are you doing with that? And they go, wait, what? What is, what is that? We don't, we don't know what that is. <laughs> and you go, okay, maybe we have something to talk about here, right? So that's just one example of how the system is designed in a way that really keeps the focus on what are you doing wrong instead of what are you doing right? So one of the shifts would be just the mindset about how we hold people in mind as they're coming into the, as they're coming into these kind of systems, how we actually kind of see people and think can about I, interaction with people. How about Jen, you, that Jen, there's that old statement that pain and problems get the ball rolling, but they will never finish the job. And at some point we have to move over. And I think the field knows now that, that we have to do a better job of that. I mean, I know that probably all you panelists saw that article two or three years ago that said probation, probation officer as coach. Um, it was just a wonderful article from, and frankly, I was surprised that the people that authored it, and, and yet, why should I be surprised? They were saying that probation officers should be more career coaches. Wow. I, you know, I've, I have used the coaching model also and found it great, of great value because in my mind, and I'm so I'm a little blown away, and I had a made a note to myself to follow up with Steve because I'm a little blown away to hear that the coaches out there aren't in the sporting world aren't doing what I think they're doing, just to sort of be on the same side as the player. And if the and that they share a win is a shared experience for a coach and a player. You know that that's. That's my mindset, so that we drew these parallels to something, but it sounds like that's not how it's working out in practice. Oh. If I can chip on, chip ask... in on that. Oh, sorry, can you go first? All right. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things here. Uh, one is, is the, um, uh, the thought about the broken house. I mean, it can certainly feel that way sometimes that the organizational culture within the correctional field is so uh, determined on seeing the, the flaws in people and, and to be punitive. And, and it, it sometimes feels like an overwhelming task to change the organizational culture to be more person-centered uh, as, a, as, a, as a foundation. And uh, one of the things that, that I think so often is missing, and I've seen it a little bit in the in the chat when, when we talk about training organizations from, from top to bottom. Uh, and, that, and, and I think that's part of it, uh, to have like serious buy-in, of course, from, 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 from management, but also how can um, the organization um, reinforce the type of uh, staff behaviors that we're looking for and how skilled are the managers 
in reinforcement the behaviors that we want to see in the staff and to uh, have conversations around staff behaviors that we know have a, a, a worse outcome. So to actually train uh, management teams in, in what type of, of um, staff behaviors are we looking for? And how can you reinforce that? I mean, you can reinforce that with the help of MI, of course. You can, you can actually train the managers to, to have uh, help with this approach to reinforce the type of behaviors that they want to see more of. And you can, I, mean, I have a few examples where that is, is done in a quite nicely way, and you get quite rapid shifts in organizational cultures once the management team strategically starts working with reinforcing the behaviors that they want to see more of. And another thing that I thought would be nice to tell you all about is a, a project that we're running in Sweden at the moment for sort of youth, youth centers um, where um, like, I think the youngest are around 12, something like that, up to 21, uh, are taken into to mandatory care. And uh, we have like the same sort of um, challenges that you all have been talking about. And one of the things we're trying out now is uh, in the hiring process to have, a, uh, have um, a candidates who apply for work do a work sample. So we have, uh, together with, with, with uh, Lars and, and the coding lab is running, we've put up a, 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 um, a standardized patient. We have a, a, um, um, uh, an actor play a 15 year old kid that doesn't go to school. And you're gonna have a 20 minute conversation with him, trying to talk to him and see how you can make him come back to school. And you record that and you have the coding lab coded with the mighty and you train the mm, management teams how the mighty works and how you can read a mighty protocol to get the information on how skillful you are in the type of, of staff behavior that you're looking for. And it's, I mean, it's really early days yet, uh, but we think it might hold a bit of a promise there. Okay, so you've brought in the motivational interviewing treatment integrity scale. <laughs> Thank you for that. making that That's, clearer, Joel. Yes, no yes, problem. Have... But that that sounds quite innovative, and it pulls together a couple of things that Ken said. One about a parallel process between the um, the managers and the staff, and the other thing that Jen was saying about the importance of using positive reinforcement. Sometimes we forget that the psychological methods that we use are meant for human beings, not just clients, you know, because it, it works across human beings and it's helpful. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all that you get rapid turnarounds when you're reinforcing and you're giving people praise and affirmation for what they're doing correctly. Yeah. And you were gonna say something. So I wanted to ask the other three panelists, uh, the one goodness <laughs> from COVID was that I did so many virtual sessions. And in virtual sessions, if you're using a certain type of software, you can do polls. And right from the get-go, I would ask, uh, have you had any motivational interviewing training? And I was surprised that corrections predominantly there was only, usually it was around 20%, 15 to 20%, if that, had not heard of it. The rest of them had had some in college uh, from at their job site. It's starting to change. And here in this state with our corrections uh, department, uh, we did a train the trainer and I had given them a, a certain form to use, a screening tool to see who might be good trainers for them, what innate abilities, right? It might be the newest person in the door. Don't give us your training department, screen people, right? To best in, best out. And darn if they didn't take it and twist it and make it better. And one of the things they did, it was so simple. They asked the question, what is punishment? And they said from the answer to that question, it illuminated people they wanted in and it illuminated people that they thought they needed more work before they, it was 
Great. So let me ask the other three panelists. Have you seen, I've seen a change. Have you seen that? Ken, what do you think? Look, look I think you, you, you're right, Michael. I, I think there's, um, you know, the risk is that people say, yes, I've done it. And I don't think they appreciate it, that like any skill set, it takes time and effort and energy to get good at something, right? So again, this idea, yep, I've done MI training. So we all sometimes get that idea, you get some pushback and go, so what's in it? But, but it's still fascinating to me. And, and I know, Joel, we were having this conversation last night. Do people still ask, you know, close questions? Yeah, I don't need my training. Just just the fundamentals. Can they do you know a, a complex reflection? Can they can they actually you know reflect what's what's implied but not said? You know to dig under the bonnet in some ways. And so these fundamental skill sets. So yeah, I've done my training, but actually some somewhere along the way, in my experience, it hasn't translated into actually it hasn't it hasn't the, the learning transfer hasn't occurred enough. And I think that's something about in the back in the work side the need for really good coaching. I think that's probably one of the big lessons out of the projects that I've been involved in, is that need to actually, as you say, to reflect on it, to actually see your practice. You know, if so often, so much practice is behind closed doors. So we don't know what people are doing in, in, in a correctional environment. So we don't know, you know, are, are, are they being in my consistent or not? And I suspect a lot of them go back to time, go back to what they used to do. So that idea of actually thinking about having your practice reflected upon and being able to see yourself as others see you is incredibly rich. I don't think that's probably where we don't invest enough in our sort of um, training change, which you might be in the States, but certainly that's not the experience. So we're doing a piece of work at the moment with, um, with a large jurisdiction and, and that's where we're doing. We're doing a lot of emphasis on coaching, coaching, getting coaches to be able then to sit down and really be able to identify those practice shifts and support the practice and to evaluate the practice. So I think that's probably where it is like, and I think that idea that the metaphor we often use is like, if you're good at a sport or a musical instrument or a language, you, you, you got to put the time in. And, um, and so it's more than a two day workshop. Yeah, it, it, this discussion is reminding me of what, whoever said it earlier, what Terry Moyers had said, why are you, why are you trick? Because yeah, we go into organizations now and we say, okay, motivational interviewing. And most of the people have heard of it. Most of the people have received training. But what was that? Was it an hour? And, and, and was there any kind of follow-up thereafter? And why would we want people who aren't intended to sit down for 20 minutes, a half an hour at a time and have a conversation to have a full MI training experience with coaching and feedback. Why would we want that? That might not be appropriate for them. Maybe there are some skills that they can benefit from in, in what they do. Are we putting our training where it really matters, where it really counts? Are we, are we giving them enough, those that need it, and, and, and then making it more appropriate to do maybe some kind of training that's more of a um, humanistic sort of approach that's not full MI. Can't, you know, where is it, where does it go? Where is it appropriate? So you'll have a lot of people saying they're trained. They can't tell you when, they can't tell you how long it was. They can't tell you who their trainer was and they can't do it and they don't really know much about it. And maybe their trainer you know, had some ideas that weren't really sort of on track for what we know or think about as we talk about MI today. Maybe they, you know, read the first edition, but never really followed up themselves. So there's a lot to it. Sure. There is. So, so part of kind of going back to my question is we haven't even got to the, 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 the mechanics of what a prison might look like physically. Or, or, or what we're talking about is before you even open the place up or create the department, the people that are going to be part of that, it's around, it's around them. It's around the, who's going to be working with the people that are going to be coming into this and how do they work with people. 
And quite often we build the secure prison and then figure out how to staff it. I just want to make a quick comment, Joel, because I think in some ways, one of the challenges is actually, why do we build prisons in the first place? And, um, you know, and, and why, do we, why do we populate them? If you build a prison, you'll fill it, right? We know that. Um, so there's something about actually those early pathways. A young person goes to prison, of course, you know, um, often from, from quite challenging backgrounds. And of course, you know, what, what, how do they build family? They, they join a gang. So recruitment, it's, it's a great place to recruit, right? Um, certainly here in, in, in our country. So there's something about actually, what are we doing to take people away? Now, the, the secondary problems of imprisonment, I think have been well documented, right? So again, this idea of actually only certain people need to be the I suspect. We, we've got a whole pathway from indigenous perspective where your pathway into prison has been through through some drug offences, right? So adolescent kind of drug offences and, you know, getting stuff which we might say is, yeah, okay, it's not major stuff, but we put people in prison, right? And of course, at that point, you're then, you're then on a pathway. Once you're in the system, it's really hard to get out. We know that. We know if you're in the system at 13, you're going to be there at 35. That's an expensive piece of work. That's a lot of time out of your life. So there's something about this idea, what are we doing to divert people quite quickly um, from the kind of the pathways that actually create further problems. And I think that's a, that's, if you think about a, an approach to criminal justice, I think that's where we need to be really being much more thoughtful. And um, there's even some, some, some thinking about, should we be putting young people in residence, you know, quite frankly, because again, you're putting young kids with other young kids who have similar experiences. And so they find they find a family. And of course, that family starts to then get, in, get engaged and then goes with them. So there's, I think there's some really interesting kind of conversations that, because we had, we had a conversation around our, our marijuana legislation, we didn't get through to legalise or decriminalise. And, and, but again, the idea was this is the pathway for Indigenous kids with drug offences and gets them into a criminal justice system. So we have an over-representation of our Indigenous population in prisons. And that's the pathway. So if you took that whole, whole drug-taking pathway away, you would actually reduce then the probability of people getting more engaged in criminal justice um, system down the track. So useful to think, I think we need to think much more laterally as well. Hmm. I will say this, that there was a probation chief down in our Southwest that was mandating and had created a consequence if people couldn't get up to basic competency. And I said, chief, tell me about that. And he looked at me and he said, you don't like that. And I said, no, no, I'm just asking you, Chief, tell me what your thoughts were. And he said, I sat through your training. I know this is the way to work. And if there's no consequences, why would my officers adopt it? And I had to, I had to do personal choice and control with him. I, I didn't really, it was a very interesting perspective. He said, why would my officers adopt it if there was no consequence for not working at or right because i wanted there's a there's a tale of two probation chiefs when i first started in 2003 after the mint there was a i got flown down to a state and we were having a session about what the motivational living was going to be like and the the head guy came in and apparently he didn't know any of this he listened to it and he said you need to go home you go ahead and pay him for the day. There is no way we're going to put this into our department because it's a threat to safety. Okay, that was 2004. Just a couple of years ago, I was doing a training just before COVID hit and an officer raised his hand mid morning of day one and said, you know, Mr. Clark, we understand all this stuff. He said, but our job is to give them their probation orders, make sure they understand it and enforce it. And before I could even respond, one of the supervisors slapped the desk and said, by gosh, you're here for more than that. I can get people with a lot less education and pay them a lot less money to do what you're talking about. You're professionals and I expect you to guide them and move them. Talk about the tale of two directors over the course of what, 15, 20 years. Wow, wow. 
So there have been changes, big changes. Yeah. 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 How about outcomes? Are the are you seeing the the recidivism rates drop um, in in your respective states and countries? Um, is are you know are things change are things actually? Is all of this effort that everybody's putting in, um, is it leading to better outcomes for the men and women who are involved in corrections facilities? And I, I know that one rehab or one prison or one probation, it's too big for one thing. But I'm just wondering if we're getting better outcomes in general when you look at just the numbers. Then you might have to break that down to what kind of the People research are talking about offenses yeah. and whatnot. The research says is now the research tells us that recidivism is going down because we're using more relational skills. And then the researchers say, but you know, officers don't know how to do that very well. Well, that's motivational interviewing right there. And I think that has been one of the reasons that things are getting better as they realize relational skills. That's your that's your thing, Steve, about the spirit of MI and just looking at techniques, right? Finally, Corrections is following you and, and Bill, albeit 15, 20 years later, but they're still, they're still coming around. What, Ken, do you have an idea of what we're seeing in New Zealand? The crime has been dropping um, for the last like, 25 years, and we see that. And, um, um, so, you know, I, I think what we see, though, we do see some spikes of so things that are outside our control, for example, like we've now got a, a deportee coming back from Australia, which seem to be gang members, 401s, uh, which are creating a whole lot of kind of um, a resurgence and some gang kind of um, stuff going on. And so, you know, we, we have those things that actually are blips, but, but we've, we've been trying to get our prison muster down, and it has been tracking down pretty well. So um, all new probation officers here get, uh, get MI training as part of their induction process. Um, they do an online package. Uh, they get some, some additional kind of coaching from their practice leaders who can, can try and make sure they're reintegrating the kind of skill sets. So, so we think that actually there is some, some real, real um, benefit happening. Um, I, I still worry though that we're not, um, with our youth uh, offending area, I think we're still missing the boat on that. We're not getting in early enough on one of those kind of things. Um, for example, I read a study the other day that said that young people engage in family violence against a parent, for example, 43% of youth family violence is against a parent. 6.5 times more likely to go on to um, more violence in, in adult relationships, in adult relationships, compared to more general um, youth offending, which is about two, two times per to go on. So you, you think about that's kind of interesting. So I think that that data, I think for me, is kind of interesting. You start to think about, you know, can, can we actually, you know, get into this younger age group and try and divert them off? So that's kind of a little bit of a mission at the moment. But I think our systems are, are not doing so well. But I, but overall, I think I think we are doing better. I think we're doing better. Okay, Kim, um, Abby Milner up at Auckland Prison would like to get in touch with you, just so you know. Um, how about, how about in Sweden, Fred, Frederick? What are, what are you aware of in, in regards to outcomes? And then we're going to give it well, a for the final word. Well, there's, there's, a, there's sort of a big um, uh, emphasis now on, on gang and gang violence being um, spiking in, in the numbers in Sweden, especially the deadly violence um, with youth has gone up. Um, and that sort of takes over the conversation. Um, but if you look at the numbers, um, crime has been, been following the same uh, sort of numbers as, as other parts of, of uh, Australia, New Zealand, and when Western Europe, uh, where it's, as, at, uh, it has been going uh, down. Still very hard to say, why is that? Um, so yeah. Okay. All right, Steve. Why don't you um, why don't you take us out for the uh, formal part of the webinar, and we'll hang out for a little while because we still have a hundred people here. It's amazing.
No, just to thank you for some remarkable stories and reflections. Very rich stuff. Wonderful. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that touched me was the outpouring of Autoha love and support for uh, Jen from the community, that the people that hang out with us um, in the chat. And I and I'm, I hope you felt that, Jim. Um, when I you told did. The story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for everybody that's reached out. I was so thankful. Good. All right. So, as I like to say, you know, the show is over, and now the party's begun. So um, we we'll hang out for a little while. Um, if anybody would like to jump in and join the conversation, just let Ange know, and she can put you up as a guest. Um, or if you have some questions you'd like to ask any any of the panelists or anybody here, please let me. In. Okay, Teresa, you can come on in. Um, Just while we wait, I don't want Ange to feel you've got to hang around. Um, if you need to leave, I'm co-hosting Ange. I right. can do it. It's supper time, Ange, so don't hesitate. Eh? Just... Hey, well, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> while that's happening, I have a question for Fred. Ready? I'm oh, here. Yeah. Dynamic security and motivational interviewing. That Have was, you seen those two things coming together? Yes, that was my um, my uh, introduction into to MI was from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working in a, in a um, in a prison in the south of Sweden and was sort of in, responsible for bringing like evidence based practice and the Canadian model into that en environment. And my, um, my superior, he was, not, he was not keen on that at all. Uh, he was from the old school and he wanted secure facility. Uh, but he, he had heard something about, and, and from the rest of the, the Swedish prison and probation service about dynamic security. And that, has an, that had a nice ring to it for him. Yeah. And uh, um, the, the, the notion that being relational with the, the inmates had uh, benefits from a security point of view was, was positive for him. He always said, I like to talk to the inmates. And, and now I, I, I realize that I've been doing this for 30 years and now the science says I've been doing it right. So he liked it. So, so that was that was how I got the funds to do um, MI trainings for for the staff in the prison. Was that the, to to bring in the relational part and and hang out with the inmates, get to know them, was um, a way to add on security because it it's harder to make mischief when you like the people that are are your guards, basically. Yeah, and, just, and also you and you get you get like you get hands-on knowledge about what's happening in your prison population yeah so let me just say something for the greater good here those of you in the u.s many of you probably are not familiar with the dynamic security model because it's mostly i think come out of scandinavia primarily um, is my understanding, but definitely Europe, I think probably uh, down under has has a little bit of that going on too. But it's really only just in the last few years started to creep into the American um, perspective, North American perspective. Um, and I think uh, it would be helpful if you're interested or curious out there and from North America, have a look at that model online and see if that might be an entrance way for people who are more of the security mindset to start to get yeah. their heads around the importance. Yeah. I, think it's, yeah. I think it's an important uh, doorway to sort of push open or window to push open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for him, it was the, uh, that was what made the shift that made it interesting for him to have methods that helped uh, the staff um, make relationships with the inmates yeah right so uh, welcome Teresa um you've been very active in the chat 
Uh, yes. I, my so, head is about to explode. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's put some pressure off so that doesn't happen. All right. So what's, for the past, what's on your mind? Um, been following Mike Clark for about the past 15 years um, at a distance where he couldn't see me. Um, but about five years ago, uh, I got a call from my administrator who said, can we bring Mike Clark back in? He's great. Every three or four years, he comes in and just gasses people up and they feel great. And in my first attempt at insubordination, I said, no. And she looked at me and says, what do you mean? And I said, we've got to stop this. We've got to stop doing these little like micro deposits of you know, one day, two day trainings with people and with no support. And so Michael and I racked our brains and we used the implementation science and we used MI to meet with our administration. And we, we used MI to get them to train every single member of our staff, right from the mailroom clerk to the wardens, to the director herself, to the corrections officer. And so we are trained, we've trained 4,500 people. So I am going into the most, some of the most difficult participants that you can imagine. I'm coming out with my hat on because of the product that Michael has created that allows us, allows us to help them to feel empowered. As you guys have heard, and you guys know as members of the Mint, that like the number one thing I hear is when I learned MI, it changed me. You know, we have staff who have PTSD, high suicide rates, divorce rates, who have never had a investment made in them to learn the proper communication skills, not just to improve the outcomes with the, with the, the population that we serve, but with themselves. People who are trained, and this is true story. I, when I first started working with the training division, my administrator came to me and he says, okay, evidence-based pra practice, reentry principles, I want you to infuse that into the curriculum. And I said, sure, no problem. And so 30 years ago, when I hired into the department, I took a snippet that said something like this, that was still in the curriculum that at, at that time. It said, it's, it's us against them. It's we're black and gray and they're orange and blue. And um, you, they're not our friends and you catch them wrong and you write them up. And I took that snippet and I sent it to, to this administrator just to see how he would respond. Well, he came out to me kind of hat in hand and he goes, Teresa, I'm not sure you're the one for this job. And I laughed. And he said, why are you laughing? I said, look at the curriculum. This is what it still says. We did this to ourselves. We have normed our population to think that our relations should be adversarial, that it was us against them. And because of that, that is what our, our staff expect. These are good people who want to do good work, and we need to give them the tools that they need to be able to do that work. And so I am so grateful to the Mint, to the agency, to Bill and Steve and Terry and all of you guys who are plugging us forward because these types of things that you're doing are gassing us up. We have, I probably have six or seven people right now from my team on this call, shout out you guys, you guys are awesome, who continue to daily either virtually or in-person train um, this body of people who are now starting to see this as our new normal. And until that becomes the norm, they will fall back to those old heavy handed tactics. So for those people who say, why train everybody? Because even if, and I've heard this from seasoned and little crunchy, that's the word I use, uh, corrections officers who think this isn't for them, even with them in class, what they will say to me is, I might not be able to do this or see the benefit for me, but at least I know what you're doing. And so I know who to tell them to go to. And mm -hmm. that's enough. That's enough to, to have them not be poking holes in our tires as we try to move this forward. All right, I'll be quiet now. Thanks, Teresa. And now you have, you feel like you got some pressure taking off? Um, yeah, it's a funny thing. I did some training in Singapore with the prisons over the years. And I think the last training I did, I had Chris Wagner as a co-trainer and they threw the pastry chef in because he has interactions with the guys in prison and he has conversations with them. And they kind of threw everybody, they get a cross section of the whole prison. And it was a really interesting training that we tried to de-jargonize as much as possible. Um, but I think there's benefit that could be for sure because you never know what's gonna rub off on somebody. Will they learn how to do MI? Maybe not, but will they learn maybe to think about how they interact with people differently? That's a win. That's a big win. Anybody else have anything to say before we? Can I, can I ask a question? It's maybe a bit of a heretical question, but I'm just thinking about what 
Frederick said to those new staff, make sure that you have conversations in which they like you and you like them. And I'm imagining that happens across the board in an organization. And there are some sporting organizations that I've come across and work with where that really is. You walk in the front door and you can smell it in the atmosphere and in the looks on people's faces. And uh, Liverpool Football Club is a very good example. And there are others. So if that's the case, right, are we making a, a, a bit of a mistake here? Us clever psychologists, mostly, are making this assumption that MI will be necessary as long as they're dehumanizing environments. Okay. Um, or, you know, if there were no dehumanizing environments, MI wouldn't be necessary. Are we making a mistake and overcomplicating it and over specializing it? Um, if you walk into, um, I've walked into some football clubs where I've seen the most remarkable things happening very naturally. Okay, they're, they're characterized by what Frederick's talking about. And then the skillful coaches are doing MI without thinking, never heard about it. But they're just evoking change talk, leaning on, a, leaning over a fence with a player who says, I'm feeling shit today. And the guy says, I wonder how you can get better. Change talk comes out of his mouth. You know, and the coach has never heard of MI. So I get to wonder sometimes, and it's a very heretical thought, I get to wonder sometimes, are we unnecessarily complicating this? And I have um, exciting and fiery arguments with Bill Miller about this because we're trying to write the fourth edition of the book and the textbook, and I'm saying, well, hang on. If the stuff's happening naturally, right, um, then, you know, this is not created by psychologists it's happening naturally yeah so what is happening naturally and how can we build on that rather than here is this special form of therapy called mi with all its nuances and complexities and then we turn around and complain about the fact that it's difficult to teach people well maybe uh do you think can you can sort of finish my sentence i'm sorry it's a bit of a late night rant but um it does make me a bit worried you know, I had, oh, Don't sorry, I, I, had, I had done some training and that training was going to result in um, them actually being mighty coded. And right before one of the guys was about to go through that process of doing his recording or live coding, I don't remember now, came into my office sweating and nervous and upset. And he said, I can't remember anything you taught me. It's all just a blank. I know there's acronyms and things I'm supposed to do, and I'm just totally freaking out. And I said, okay, all right, <laughs> here's what you're yeah. going to do. I yeah. said, don't, don't try and remember all that stuff. Just do two things. Stay curious and look for what's good. Well, that, that's what Jurgen Klopp does. If you read any quotation from Jurgen Klopp, the head coach of Liverpool, this is what he does. And he felt so much better. And then he went and did an excellent <laughs> demonstration of yeah. motivational interviewing. But, you know, it, it, I want to say something, to Teresa, because I did sort of say, oh, why are we training everybody? And she, she came back with some really valid points. And we were just talking before about the us versus them mentality that we've, that we've had. But it's not just us versus them. It's it's treatment staff versus security staff also. And they're going like this. And here's the problem with that. How much time does someone who's incarcerated get to spend with a therapist? Yeah. Not very much. But how can, can much I just time chip in off the lot then? Yeah. Do they spend with those security? Those guys, those security guys and gals are there every day, all day. They know what's happening. They know who's getting along with who, who. So when we start to bring them in and say, you are a part of the solution. You are a part of behavior change for these individuals. You have influence here. You have great influence. And, 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 and draw them in. Not only do they feel a sense of, of professional 
um, acumen and professional um, uh, uh, approach in what they're doing, but they also um, feel empowered to, to do things differently, I think. And your best and that, officers that, are doing it. Are doing yeah, that, not as intentional. Sorry. Just going to say that rings so much true, Jen. Uh, I remember talking to a 17 year old locked up kid and uh, I was sort of hanging on the wall, trying to give some feedback to the staff while they were working. And this kid looked up to me and said, yeah, so who are you and why are you here? And I was, well, you know, I train MI, I'm from the HQ. Oh, MI. I know MI. I have MI conversations, he said to me. Oh, wow, interesting. What do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, they're all right. But, you know, it's all an act, he said. What? What do you mean? What do you mean all an act? You know, it's just the stuff putting on an act. Because, you know, uh, once a week, I have one of those MI conversations. And they're quite nice, you know. It's all about me, what I want, how I sort of see my future. And it's so, it's so strange because I do most of the talking. But, you know, all the other time, everybody else is just telling me what to do all the time. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's just something they do, like they've been on a course <laughs> or something. Yeah, and Frederick, when I put this, this point to uh, uh, our friend Dave Rosengren about, you know, good practices happening naturally, he said, but is it intentional? And I think, I think that's a very useful point, which is that we want to teach the security guards and these people to be intentional about why they're speaking to people in this way. Yeah. Um, and maybe a little bit about the damage being done to outcomes by being authorian, like 23 okay. hours of every day, and then you have exactly. one hour of sort of person-centered conversations. And, and probably it would be quite a shift if more of the everyday interactions are infused in a sort of yeah. person-centered, caring, caring way. And, and maybe, and that's sort of the uh, idea from, from um, uh, I think it was Miller and, and um, Bill and, and, and Terry who wrote the uh, Slow Empathy Toxic article back in, 2012 yeah, or something like that and sort of came up with the idea that maybe we should start looking for people who do this more naturally yeah. and if we tra train those people to do what comes rather naturally for them to do that in an intentional way maybe we will come a bit further yeah mm -hmm. do you know the um... I think there's also, sorry, there's also i think it's a fundamental ethical issue isn't it we if, if we're going to lock people up we should send them out the gate no worse, preferably better than when they walked in the gap. And I think that's a fundamental philosophical, ethical issue that, that systems haven't got hold of. And, and, and that idea of lateral impact, that actually if, if, if we make people less help-seeking, we make them more angry, we make them more disengaged from the world, you know, we pay a price back in our communities. And, and I think there's a fundamental kind of issue that people just need to get their head around going, actually, what are we doing to actually make people a little better? Because that's the idea of, of that's a, a strong philosophy in criminal justice. But I think somewhere along the line, it's got a bit lost at times. And uh, every action should be, I think staff should just ask the question, am I making this person better or worse in this interaction? That's the only question you need to ask, I think, Stephen, in some ways. And, and we, can, uh, we, we can ask that in, in multiple kind of circumstances. Yeah, am I making it better or worse? And, and at that point, we, we, we'll answer our own question around, is my interaction enhancing or degrading the person, going back to the very fundamental place we start the conversation today? Well, uh, so how about we do a round and Teresa, I want you to join in as well too. How about we do a round and just everybody share some reflections from the conversation before we close up. And we'll start with, we began with Jen, so we'll start with Frederick. What are some of your reflections on this conversation? 
Well, I think some something that sort of strikes me is both the enormous benefits of this type of approach that we are working with for the populations that we serve, and that those benefits sort of ring through in, in, in all of the stories from, from all over the world. We have heard some, some, some really amazing examples of, of how MI and, and sort of person-centered, person-valued approaches make such a huge impact um, for, for the people that sits in front of us, but also for the society as a whole. And I think the thing that you sort of ended with, Ken, are we making people worse off when we put them into to locked custody is a really important one. So, so do we have a, a moral obligation to, to help transform the way that we work with people that we as a society take into, into custody um, is a really, really valid one. Um, so, so I think that's, that's sort of what stands out for me. And maybe also sort of the challenges with turning around the organizational cultures or the, the broken houses. Uh, but again, how important it is. Jim, what are some of your thoughts? Um, you know, I think I'm just really going back to what you had asked earlier, Joel, about from a systems perspective in the field most more generally, how broken is it and, and, and what would it look like if we did it well? And I can't help. And, and then I think about what Teresa said also about like so much of our policy and procedure is counter. And you can't teach someone to be wary and suspicious of another person and then say, and be engaging and curious. And that's what we're still doing. So we, we must look towards policy work first and foremost. We must look at all the pre-service pre training that these officers and, and professionals are getting, all the pre-service training they're getting. If we're going to do it well, we can't have two different messages that counter each other. Mr. Clark, what are your thoughts? It's hard to sum this up, uh, Joel. What a wonderful session. I, to me, I'm, I'm left with the idea of Occam's razor. Um, and, what, and, and what is the idea of Occam's razor? Well, I would say the simplicity of what uh, Frederick's uh, story was, you know, I, and I wonder about that because I know that uh, it's, it's hard on staff and it's hard on those that we work with in corrections. And I've seen MI improve both. But mm -hmm. this issue of just trying to meet them and say, look, I see you, I hear you. They, they're looking, you know, I, I really believe that Ambivalence is your, is what? Your co-therapist, your co-helper, your co-provider, right? The, the part of them that wants to do it. That's what I'm left with. All right. Teresa, what, what thoughts do you have? And listening. Well, a lot of what you said, I don't want to be redundant, but I think that the, the thing that resonates for me is um, the knowledge that there are other people who, um, who believe that we can we can still work with this population and that we can return the whole idea of humanity back into to what we're doing and so my passion is to instill hope in people and um the, the population that we need to do that with is, is is not just the the clientele we're using but with the staff as well they are genuinely good people who want to do good work and we need to give them those tools and make that investment and so i'm just i'm grateful for the body of people who are willing to 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 join us in that all right, Ken, can you, can you round it off and bring us home? <laughs> well, it's been a really rich conversation and thank you to my colleagues and um, for joining me. I, I, I'm reminded of the old AA saying that hurt people hurt people, right? And, um, and so that idea that actually 
we, we can't take people on a, on a journey of change unless we have a relationship. And, um, and, and we talk about accountability, and I, I get that, and, and it is that go forward position, but I can't do that from a position of bullying. I can only do that from a position of a relationship. And, and we can still hold the line, because I, I, I don't I work with men who sexually offend, I work with men who, who bash up their partners. That, that, that's not okay behaviour, we know that. And, and so we can hold the line on that stuff, but we, can only, we, we, we can't model abusive practice because that's the thing we're trying to change. So I think it's that notion for me that what MI gives us, I think it's the spirit of MI in some ways. There's that idea of partnership, find, find a connection. There's that idea of empathy. Uh, compassion. Uh, I think it's the idea of being curious, as, as Jen said, you know, but let's, let's figure out your story here. And um, and we can change your story. We can support you to change your story. But it starts from that position, I think, of, of a place of knowing uh, as a place, a place of relationship. And then let's, let's walk this journey together. So that's, I guess, where I've got to. And I'm passionate about, you know, um, supporting change in this in these systems. And you all are doing that, and you've been doing it for a long time. And sure. I think we need champions inside the room, and we need champions outside the room working together. Steve, anything you'd like to say before we say good night, good day? Yeah, you know, listening to you guys working in a field that I'm not familiar with, I'm very struck by um, the power of labels that get attached to folk in your environment and how damaging that must be um which which takes me right back to the beginning of mi where you know we had this sort of shared insight that if you just don't label people and it was phrased in quite a kind of a negative way stop doing that almost like slapping yourself on the hand don't label people but then it reminds me of a conversation i had with a with a with a with a head coach of a, of a football club <laughs> and he, he he was wanting to employ an assistant and so he said we don't come on to the interview panel and I said now hang on hang on it's not going to be about the clever question that gets asked in this interview could I could I make a suggestion and he says yeah I said take your top five candidates and go for a walk with each of them around the ground once around the ground and then he said so what should I look for and I said well, how's about getting a feeling from them whether you like them as a person and whether they view the footballers as people, not f just footballers. And I said, then if you can grade those, th those people and then th the person who comes out top there is probably the guy you want. And um, so it gets translated into look at, look at them as people first. And that's a phrase widely used in sport. Uh, it should be used in education, but boy, oh boy, in criminal justice, <laughs> doesn't it just uh, have resonance, you know? Wow, that's very striking listening to your conversation, how damaging the labels are that, that get attached to people. That's my reflection. Well, I think I think my my takeaway from this is that you know if I I'm not looking for something to change it's about with with the folks that we're working with and the and the and the teams that we're working with it's not about what we do it's about how we do it um, and I I think that we do have to shift to a more relational approach and less of a consequential one um, because if people are going to make huge changes in their life, they need to have pretty good reasons as to why they're going to do it. Um, like leave the gang, because that's, you know, and all we have to offer them is basically a relationship. Um, hey Joe, I'm just reminded, of I'm sorry, can I just share this one story with you? My absolutely. Oldest, my oldest son's a police sergeant and he got called to a local small supermarket, right? Quite recently and um, he walked in because somebody was going berserk in a supermarket and tearing the shelves down and everything. And he walked in and as he walked in, he heard, he heard the, the criminal say, there's no point in calling the police because Sergeant Rolnick's a friend of mine, right? As he walked in, right? So <laughs> he got hold of the guy and 
put him in the back of the car and said to him, how can you say that? How dare you say that? We know each other well, but how dare you say that? I'm not a friend of yours. Right? And then he, he, now I don't know what to make of this story, right? I really don't, right? It's certainly passion behind it. He said to him, do you remember James? And the guy said, yeah, I remember James. He said, I had to cut James down from a rope last week. Now, do you want to grow up to enjoy your baby daughter or you want to go the way of James, right? And <laughs> I then asked him what happened to the guy and their relationship endured and continued in this kind of, but I think what, you know, what my son was conveying to him was a passionate concern for his well-being as a person, even yeah. though he was using, you know, a confrontational manner and some quite bizarre kind of things. But what shone out of the story for me was this boy is um, really concerned about this guy and is treating him as a person and wants him to grow up as a person, not as yeah. a criminal. Anyway, there you go. I, that, it, uh, well, they, 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 a place of confrontation, <laughs> I must say. Well, I think I think that's a, a, a fine place to say goodbye um, for the month. <laughs> and uh, Jen, Mike, Ken, Freddie, Teresa, uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing yourselves. Um, and as always, pulling all the levers behind the scenes much appreciated um and um we'll uh, we'll come up with a topic over the next couple of weeks and we'll crank up the next one uh for april good lord this time's flying um <laughs> thanks you all uh, all right guys we'll see you yeah thank you so much everyone thank you everyone pleasure hey steve pleasure. can you hang out for five minutes i got an yeah, idea sure. Just don't label me. What, is a cranky old bastard? <laughs> <laughs>